Take your Bible tonight, go to Matthew 24, if you would please. Matthew chapter 24. We got us going here, Dean. Matthew 24. Can you hear that all right? You okay, Cindy Lake? Can you hear it all right? She's not even looking at me, so she must not hear it. <clears throat> can you hear that, Cindy Lake? Now you can hear it? Okay, good. That's better. I'm starting to hear it more now, so uh, it has to be louder than the other voices in my head. We'll be all right. And uh, Matthew 24, and then put a finger, if you would, over in 1 Thessalonians 5. Matthew 24, and then 1 Thessalonians 5. Matthew 24, and if you look with me at verse number 42, the Bible says, Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And then over in 1 Thessalonians 5, I want to remind you that 5, 1 Thessalonians 5 follows 1 Thessalonians 4. Boy, you learn the Bible when you come here, don't you? And, uh, but we end chapter 4 with, uh, with the coming of Christ. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them has travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober." For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for our helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Now let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the scriptures here that we've read tonight. And Lord, I pray that we'll take seriously the admonition that, have been, that has been given to us, that we would all be ready, that we would be prepared for the coming of our Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'd bless our study together this evening that we would grasp a hold of just what it means to be ready and that we would live it out daily in our lives and that, Lord, we would be good testimonies and shining examples to others in this world who know not our Savior, Jesus Christ. So bless our time in your word tonight and Holy Spirit help us in Jesus' name. Amen. A man called 911 and said, My wife's pregnant and her contractions are only two minutes apart. And the 911 operator said, is this her first child? And the, <laughs> and the fellow said, no, of course not, I'm her husband. <laughs> Boy, if i got to wait for you folks, you're really sleeping tonight. But, you know, someone said the theme of the Bible, uh, from Genesis to Malachi through the Old Testament, is the theme, Christ is coming. Christ is coming. The Gospel preaches Christ is here. Christ is here. The rest of the New Testament, from Acts to Revelation, the theme is again, Jesus is coming again. And, uh, and that's certainly the theme we're going to look at tonight as the Bible talks about, be ye also ready. The word that's used when the Lord talks about us uh, being 
prepared for his return is to be ready for his return. Let me illustrate. I read this week about a superintendent of a large Christian school, and he attended several classrooms, and he was very concerned about the uh, disarray that he saw in so many classrooms, as particularly papers on the floor and students' desks were surrounded by clutter, and so feeling strongly that learning wouldn't take place in such an environment, he decided he'd take some action, and so he went into one classroom, and he introduced himself to the students, and he made this proposition. He said, your teacher, your principal, and I want to provide a well-equipped classroom for you to enjoy, but we need to have your help in keeping it clean and orderly and keeping your desks in order. Many of you have crumpled papers inside your desk and books are left open and pages are bent. Often there's pencils on the floor under your desk along with other debris. I want each of you to clean out your desk today and begin this school year resolving to keep it clean. I will return and I will inspect your desks with the person and the person with the neatest desk will be given this $100 bill. And he held up a $100 bill. I'm not going to tell you what day it is that I'll return. It will be a surprise. Not even your teacher or the principal will know the day. Well, the students were very excited and they began immediately pulling things out of their desk and filling the trash basket with papers and getting their books stacked neatly uh, inside their desks and uh, neatly lining up their pencils and pens and uh, really, every morning for the first week, every student was so conscientious and keeping things neat and keeping things orderly and throwing things away and putting things where they belong, confident that any day the superintendent was going to show up again and, and check the desk. But the second week came, and a few of the boys started getting a little weary of keeping things neat, and they began to return to their former habit. By the third week, several students had begun to do so. And they said, I doubt if he's coming back at all. He just told us that to get us to keep our desk clean. After two months, nobody in the classroom bothered to inspect their desk. In fact, they'd forgot the superintendent's promise, except for one girl. Dutifully, she inspected her desk every morning and several times a day, making sure things were in proper order. For months, she was teased by the other students. He's not coming back. Why do you keep looking for him? You look stupid believing that promise anyway. And she kept quiet, kept her desk in perfect condition, and waited. It wasn't until nearly the end of the school year when there was a knock on the door and the superintendent entered. Quickly, the students flung their desks open and began to frantically clean them out. But the superintendent held his hand up and told them all to stop. One after one, he went, he asked each student to stand beside their desk at attention while he inspected each desk. One after another was rejected for being unkept. Several tried to give excuses, but to no avail. Still another blamed the superintendent for making them wait so long. Finally, the superintendent arrived at the desk of the girl who confidently displayed her well-kept desk while beaming at the superintendent. After inspecting her desk, he took her by the hand to the front of the classroom and awarded her the $100 bill. Boys and girls, he said, this girl never stopped believing I would return. So she kept her desk in perfect order. She didn't worry about what day or even what time of day I would arrive because she was always ready. Always. And ready is what we're talking about tonight. Be ye also ready, Jesus said, for when He returns. What does it mean to be ready? What does that mean? I'm going to look at it tonight. I think it means four things. And this is where 1 Thessalonians 5 comes in for us. What does it mean to be ready? Number one, it means to be informed. It means to be informed. If you notice 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse number 4, the Bible says, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, then that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light 
and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. We have, we have a responsibility to teach and to preach, not only to ourselves, but to our children, to those in our church, that Jesus Christ is coming again. And, and He's coming uh, at any moment. We need to be prepared. We do not know the day. We do not know the hour. We do not know the... Don't, don't listen to someone who sets a date. I just read, uh, just read Reese's. Uh, she put a post on, I think, where a guide over in Jerusalem said something about, oh, this is happening and this is happening. And Jesus is coming again in 2022. And um, maybe He will. But maybe He'll come in 2017 yet. Uh, we don't know the day or the hour that will come. But I know He's going to come. And so, you notice what it says. It says in um, verse number 4, Ye brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. The word overtake means to, to take hold of are, are to take hold of by surprise. So it, it, the, the world, hey, let me understand, when Jesus comes back, the world is going to be caught by surprise. I mean, when that trumpet sounds and we're gone in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, as the Bible says, and, and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and all the dead in Christ rise, and they come out of the graves, and they're rising to meet the Lord in the air, can you imagine the chaos that's going to take place in this world? I, I, can you imagine if, if the pilot of the airplane or the pilots in the airplane are saved individuals and all of a sudden there's no pilot on the plane? Can you imagine somebody frantically getting on the intercom? Can anybody fly this plane? <laughs> We're in trouble. And, and, and there's all kinds of uh, car accidents and car wrecks and explosions and everything that's going to take place. This world is going to be, they're shocked. And, and I can't, I, I'm not sure what excuse they're going to use but they'll come up with some excuse as to what happened to all these people. Uh, whether they'll say it's an alien invasion or whatever it may be, uh, they'll come up with something other than the fact that it's what the Bible talked about. Yeah. Jesus came back and took his, his, his out of this world. They won't want to say that. But we're not caught by surprise because we know the warning. We, we've heeded the message. We're, we're going to be ready for Him to come. You see... God warned for years that the flood would come. Noah, the Bible says in the New Testament, was a preacher of righteousness. And Noah preached and warned them of the judgment that was coming. And they laughed at him. How many people today, when you talk about Jesus returning and Jesus coming and He's going to take His own out of this world, they laugh at you. That's a, they, they, they don't believe in that. They think that's, that, that's something to be mocked and laughed at. and that, That's the way it was in Noah's day. In fact, Noah got, got no one to believe outside of his family. Just eight of all the population of the world believed and got into the ark with Noah and were saved and avoided the judgment of God. Lot warned his family that the city was going to be destroyed. And again, he couldn't get them to believe, partly because of his poor testimony. And, then, and he lost precious family members who did not heed the warning and didn't want to listen uh, to the warning. And so, the Bible says here, if you notice in verse number 5, ye are the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. In, in the Bible, light always, always signifies spiritual direction. Darkness always signifies a lack of spiritual direction. We are in the light. When we walk in the light, we're walking with some spiritual direction. We know where we're going. You, you, you uh, trust in the Lord uh, with all thine heart. Lean not to own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall what? He'll direct your path. He'll direct the way you're supposed to walk. It's not a mystery. It's not, and I'm not trying to figure out what we're supposed to do next. We have spiritual direction. But the lost have no spiritual direction. They have no idea what's going on. You know, that it's, it's as tragic as, as the shooting was last Sunday, as tragic as the shooting was in Las Vegas uh, uh, back in the 1st of October. Listen, I understand the, the depravity and the sinfulness of man. 
That's, it's, when God had man created in the beginning, in the flood era, remember, he said he saw that the imaginations of their heart was only evil continually. You have to understand, the, the reason the world is so befuddled by this, and they're, they're still saying, why would a guy do this? Why would anybody do this? I tell you why. Because of the depravity of man. Man is wicked. They want to say man is basically good. And that's where the fallacy comes in. They're, they're, they're walking in darkness. They don't have any delight at all. The only way we know that the heart of man, listen, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's the heart of man. That's why murders and, 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 and all the sins that are listed, where does it come from? From the heart. It's the heart of man. We're born sinners. So, but how do we understand that? How do we have any direction on that? Because we walk in the light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so the word of God has enlightened us on that matter. And we understand those things because we understand the Bible. Okay? So there's really two types of people when it comes to people who will see Christ. First of all, those who are, who are not looking for Him. Those are the unbelievers, the, the people who are not Christians. They do not believe in Jesus Christ. And it'll be just like the days of Noah, when no one else would believe him. No one else would believe it's going to rain. No one else would believe it's going to flood. No one else believed there was a God who was going to judge them for what they'd done. But I'm sure that there were a lot of folks, I, I just got to believe there were a lot of folks pounding on that ark when it started to rain. That's why I think the Bible said that they went into the ark, and you read about it in Genesis, it says God shut the door. It was, I think if it had been up to Noah, Noah would have got soft-hearted and probably opened it up and let some folks in. Because your heart would go out to folks screaming for their life. Because not only did the rain begin to come down from above, but the Bible says the fountains of the deep were opened up. And water began to come up out of the earth. And I think there was a great upheaval uh, in the earth at that time. And folks were crying out for their life. But they were totally shocked by what was taking place. But I tell you what, it was too late. Too late. They couldn't do anything. And then, of course, the second group are those who are looking for Him. And those are supposed to be the believers. We're supposed to be looking for Him. We're supposed to be expecting His return. Eagerly anticipating His return. And, and, and sadly, that's not always the case. Sometimes we, we talk good, but we don't live it that good. It's so easy to get caught up in everyday life. And, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, we can say, well, I think I went, I've gone quite a while without thinking and without expecting to see Jesus come. Get so caught up in everything else that, that, that takes place. I'm not really looking for Him. You know, I think a few weeks ago when I was gone, look at Matthew 25. Would you turn over there with me? Matthew chapter 25. I believe you, we covered this in Sunday school. I think Brother Moreland did. Um, when Jesus gave the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25. He said the kingdom of heaven in verse 1 will be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. You could say five were walking in the light and five were walking in darkness. They had no spiritual direction. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, <clears throat> the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest, you be not, lest there not be enough for us and you. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were ready. They that were what? Ready. They that were what? Ready went in with him for the marriage. And then what happened? The door was shut, meaning no one else was coming in. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, 
open to us. But he answered and said, and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Very similar to Matthew 7, isn't it? Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? Didn't we do this? And the Lord said, I don't know you. So what did he, what he conclude in verse 13? Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. You do not know. So we're warned to look for Him. Be expecting Him. We're, 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 we're ready. We're looking. If, if we're not looking, if we're not expecting, if we're not informed and know that these are the days where Jesus could come and we could see Him, if we're not anticipating Him coming, who is? If, if we don't do it, if, if people who say they know Christ and we want to follow Him, if we're not anticipating His return, then who would? Who is there? It has to be us. And we are not of the night, we're of the day. We're not of the darkness, we're of the light. And so it means, when be ready means we're to be expecting, we're to be looking for Jesus to come. And when He comes, there'll be that separation of the two groups, those who believe in Christ and are looking for Him and those who do not. And they'll be left behind. Two groups. Believers and unbelievers. So, the, what, what does be ready mean? It means be informed. Be informed. Be expecting Him to come. Then number two, back in 1 Thessalonians 5, notice with me verse number three. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And then verse number six. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Here, we're supposed to be alert. Be alert. You know, when someone's asleep, they're not very alert. Okay? You're not very, in, you're not very involved with things that are going on around you. Okay? You're, you're, uh, how many of you are hard sleepers? Huh? Any hard sleepers? Yeah, I mean, when you're, you're done, I mean, the atomic bomb could go off and you would have to find out about it later. Okay? And no one, uh, it, it just doesn't bother you. And, 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 you know, when you're sleeping, you're, you're not aware of what's going on. And listen, there's a lot of Christians that are sleeping. Not aware of what's going on around them. Not aware of the times in which we live. And, and not involved in what's going on around them. Don't be spiritually asleep. When you're spiritually asleep, it means you're not involved with the things of God. You're not involved with the work of God. You're not in tune with what God wants to do in this world and what God wants to do in your life and through your life. You're sleeping through it. Don't be that way. Don't be caught off guard. Don't, don't be lulled into thinking there's plenty of time. How many, how, many, uh, uh, how many of you parents here tonight with grown children, how many of you will say, you can't believe how fast the years went by. Huh? Look at that. I know. Some of you with young children here, you're thinking, will they ever grow up? <laughs> I know. They'll testify to you that they grow up way too fast. And, and uh, it, it just goes by so quickly. It's hard to understand that. But it does. Don't get lulled into thinking there's plenty of time. Listen, let's not, let's not sleep like the disciples did when Jesus asked them to pray. Jesus Himself said, pray with me. And when He came back, He's pouring out His heart to God, sweating as it were great drops of blood in great agony in prayer. And He comes back to the three who were closest to Him. Expecting, I think, to hear them crying out to God on His behalf to strengthen Him and to help Him. And He comes back and all He hears is, they're sleeping. Not, not once, not twice, three times. Three times. When He returns to earth, I don't want Him to find me sleeping. I want to be alert. Awake. In fact, look at Romans 13, would you please? Keep your finger there in 1 Thessalonians 5. We'll come back to that. Romans 13. Romans 13.
Notice verse 11. The Bible says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And he's talking about the return of Christ. Listen, he's, it, our salvation is, that's the completion of our salvation, is when we see Jesus. And, and we'll, it'll be completed, and, and this corruptible will put on incorruption, and this, this mortal will put on immortality, and we'll be changed. And finally, our salvation will be complete because we'll be delivered not just from the penalty of sin, and not just from the power of sin, we'll be delivered from the presence of sin and go to be with the Lord Jesus. And our salvation will be complete. But he says, listen, now's the time. Let's wake up. Let's be aware. So often I think we're the church, so many Christians are in the, in the boiling pot of the world. And we've gotten into their pot and they're slowly warming the fire and we don't realize what, what we're in. And they're, they're cooking us. And we don't realize we're being cooked. And, and we have to understand, wake up church. Wake up Christians. Let's be aware of what's going on around us. Notice in Romans chapter 6. Go back a few chapters, will you? Notice in, he talks about how Christ was raised from the dead and how He'll die no more because death will have no minion over Him. And, and that He died once in verse 10. He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wouldn't it be great if I could be dead to sin? How do, you, how do you tempt a dead man? You know what the answer is? You can't. <laughs> you can do anything you want to that guy. He's dead. He's not responding to anything. Wouldn't it be great if you were dead to sin that way? Nothing the devil throws at you. Nothing the, the world comes at you. Nothing appeals to you. I'm dead to sin. Oh, but I'm alive to God. Alive to the things of God. You've heard me talk about this before. Why is it we can sit in church sometimes and, and as much as we sometimes even want to be alive and awake, sometimes we sit there and... Yeah. And we're nodding off and we're, 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 we're like not, not quite there. And think, man, will he ever get done? But what is it about as soon as you say, Amen! All of a sudden, bing! Hey, let's go get something to eat. Let's go to Taco Bell. Let's do this. Let's do this. What's on TV? What's going on? And we go home and we stay up till 11 or 12 o'clock. You say, man, I was so tired in church. Why am I, why am I, sometimes it seems like I'm so sleepy or dead to the things of God and alive to the things of the world. I want it to be the other way around. See? And it should be the other way around. I want to be alert and alive to the things of God. And so, reckon yourselves. See? Count yourselves. Ask God to help you to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God. I heard a radio preacher give this illustration. Uh... They heard while he was living in England. In Liverpool, a couple had their car stolen from their home one night. Several days later, they woke up to find their car back in their driveway. Cleaned, full of gas, and a note on the front seat containing an apology for whatever inconvenience they may have caused and two tickets to the theater for that night. The couple was needless to say very impressed <laughs> that somebody had a twinge of conscience I guess and decided to return their car and apologize and give them theater tickets. So of course they drove and went to the theater that night to find out when they came home from the theater their house had been burglarized. <laughs> True story. If the couple had just been a little bit suspicious. If they just would have been alert.
to what might have been going on. They might have skipped the theater and waited for the intruder. But they had no idea. You know, that's what the Scripture means when it says, watch. Be on the lookout. Those, those, th- 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 those admonitions to watch and be alert and be ready, that's always to us. That's always to Christians. It's not to lost people. It's to God's people. And so, uh, we, we, we're, we're watching and we're ready and we're alert. So, we say, what does it mean to be ready? Number one, it means to be informed. Number two, it means to be alert. Number three, back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8. It means in verse 8, Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but James salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Number three is be prepared. Be prepared. You know, most of you know, you know, back in February, I think it was February, our house was broken into. And I uh, came home one day and the door was open and the front door had been crowbarred open. It was dead bolted and everything and they just busted the whole thing in. And um, I was hoping they'd break in and think, well, somebody's already beat me to it. But uh, they... They, they took a few things, but not, nothing uh, terribly bad, but the house was ransacked pretty well. They opened drawers and dumped stuff out and things like that. And, and uh, then we decided that, well, we probably ought to get some sort of an alarm system. Okay? So now we have an alarm system at our house. But, you know, a lot of people, we, we, we do that after we got broke into. Probably would have been smart to do it before we got broke into. Okay? But a lot of people do that. After something happens, then we want to do something and, and, and try to uh, get something, uh, get an alarm or get, get different locks or something like that. But here, God is telling us, be sober. It doesn't mean just not to be intoxicated, but it means to get serious about this. How serious are you about being ready for the Lord to come? Being ready and being watchful for the return of Jesus Christ. Are you prepared? And the way to get prepared, it's interesting, is he, he talks about the armor of God. To put on the armor. So I, I think, well then, maybe one of the things that Satan loves to do, and one of the attacks that he puts on the Christian, is to get us to forget about the fact Jesus is coming again. But let's forget about that. No, he says, you better stay serious about this. Don't, don't get off track. Listen, when Jesus came the first time, there were, there, there were very few that believed that it was Him. They weren't looking for Him. They weren't expecting Him. Oh, Anna in the temple was, and, Zach, and um, um, Simeon in the temple was. They were waiting for Him. When the, when the announcement came, He made it to shepherds. Who else was going to believe Him? He gave it to the shepherds. And so they weren't prepared. So he says, get the armor on, is what he's talking about. And he says, put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The breastplate, of course, protects the heart of the soldier. And so we understand our heart has to be protected. Guard the heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You have to guard your heart. The heart has to continually be committed and focused on Jesus Christ. Set your affection, it's your heart, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay? You have to love the Lord with all your heart. That's the breastplate. Then the hat, the, the helmet. The helmet, you know, it's interesting. The, the helmet or the, the, the headgear you wear is, obviously it's for protection, but it's also for identification. You can tell a lot about a person by what they wear. If I, if I put a fireman's hat on here, you'd, you'd identify that guy's a fireman. Policeman's hat, that guy's a policeman. In baseball, you'd look at the hat. You can tell what team they play for because of the headgear they wear. And so the, the, the helmet of salvation is intended not only for protection, but it's also our identification. It shows who we belong to. Your salvation ought to clearly show others who you belong to. Who do I identify with? The whole reason that, that you want to 
look like a Christian and act like a Christian and walk like a Christian is because I want people to, I want people to, if they find out I'm a Christian, I don't want them to be surprised. The reason I don't have blue hair and earrings and piercings all over my face, okay, is because I don't want people to think I'm on the wrong team. I'm on Jesus' team. And, and I tell folks when I go out and visit people or knock on their door, I don't want them to look out and think right away, well, that's a preacher. But I don't want to be surprised when they find out I am one. Okay? And uh, it's, 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 it's what you ought to know that you're a Christian. Every one of us has had the experience, I think, of being out in public at a store or a mall or on traveling, and you, you see someone, and if it's a young lady and they're dressed modestly and they have a nice skirt on and they, they look nice and their hair's fixed real nice, you begin to think right away, I wonder if they are a Christian. We were traveling out to Illinois one of those times when we stopped at a rest area in Indiana. Remember? And we just stopped to have lunch there. And uh, we got the picnic table and Kathy unpacked the lunch and we had uh, Drew. Do we have Drew with us? And uh, we were traveling and so uh, we started to have lunch and two girls stopped and they came over to the picnic table and both of them had uh, jean skirts on that were long length and, and nice outfits on and they sat down and we noticed when they sat down to eat, you know what they did? We saw them pray. So right away we think, they're probably Christians. See? They're probably Christians. Identification. Identification. And they were. They were with the Independent Baptist uh, for Asians out of Marietta, Ohio, that we, Brother Jess Coeli is with and uh, those are others we support. So uh, we got a chance to talk to them. So it's our identification who you identify with. And so be prepared. Be prepared. Put on the armor of God. Put on the breastplate. Put on the helmet of salvation. Hey, let it be known whose team you're on. Let it be known whose side you're on. And be prepared. Have the, have the, the, the armor of God on and fight against the wiles of Satan. So be informed, be alert, be prepared. And then lastly, number four, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort one another, or comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. Remember at the end of chapter 4 when he talked about the Lord coming back and the dead in Christ rising first, and we which alive remain were caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Verse 18, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And so, be a comfort. It did not say, be comfortable. Okay? It said, be a comfort. <clears throat> be an encouragement, if you will. The best way you can encourage somebody is to remind them of the fact we have a blessed hope to look forward to. Hey, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is returning for you and me. That is the blessed hope of the believer. And again, in the Bible, hope is not across your fingers, carry a four-leaf clover in my pocket, and, and kiss a horseshoe. You know, it's not, it's not I hope, I hope, I wish, I wish. It is a certainty. It is an absolute certainty. That's what hope is as it's used in the Bible. And we have that blessed hope in Jesus Christ. That's why we encourage each other with those words. And we, we comfort one another with those words. Turn, if you will, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. Hebrews 10, notice in verse number 23... Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That's that word again of comforting one another, encouraging one another, exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye what, church? See the day approaching. What day is approaching? It is the day of Christ's return. It is the day when we'll be caught up to meet Him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're looking forward to that day. And I don't know when that day will be. Nobody knows when the day will be. But I want to be prepared for that day. I want to be ready for that day. I want to be thinking about that day. I want to be informed about that day. I want to be alert and prepared. And I want to encourage others with that day. You know, some days you just need to hear that. Some days you just need to hear, yeah, you know what? Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming again. 
We're all going to be taken out of this place. I, I was talking to someone today, and I mentioned about the shooting that happened Sunday in Texas. And they said, what, what are you talking about? They did not know. They don't watch the news, make it a habit not to watch the news. And, and because, they said, that kind of stuff upsets them. And it bothers them. And so their bed, their bed's better off if they don't watch it. I understand that. And, and if that's the way it is with you, don't watch it. Guess what? It'll all happen whether you know about it or not. Okay? And, and you can keep your mind focused on better things than, than those kind of things that go on. But you understand, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. <laughs> and we all are. We're just pilgrims. We're just coming through. We're just traveling through. And one day, we're going higher. We're going higher. What a day that'll be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon His face the One who saved me by His grace and He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Won't it be grand? Uh, that day's coming. And what are we supposed to do? Be ready. Be ready when He comes. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank You, Lord, for speaking to our hearts. Thank You, Lord, for the wonderful promise that You will come again and receive us unto Yourself. That where you are, there we may be also. And we want to be ready for you to come. Lord, I pray that each of us would live our lives each and every day with the understanding maybe today our Lord will come for us. And Lord, we'll be faithful. We'll be true. And we'll keep our affection set on things above and not on things on the earth. We love you. We thank you for your wonderful promise. Help us to be a comfort and an encouragement to one another with these words. And help us to be ready. Now Lord, we want to be ready for Sunday. We're ready for the Lord's Day. We're praying that you'll bless the labor that goes into the flyers going out. <clears throat> the food that's being prepared. The things that are all, all the setup and the work that's being done to receive people here. I pray Lord that you'll help the house to be filled. Many, many guests coming. That they'll sense the Spirit of God in this place. The love of Jesus Christ. And they'll be drawn to the Savior on Sunday. Pray for many souls to be saved and for lives to be touched. For your honor and glory. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. And help us to be busy about your business in these days ahead. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. The windows of heaven are open. <coughs> and blessings are falling tonight. Where are these, Bob? <clears throat> Brother Taylor in the back has these little pieces of paper. These are the eight mighty men of valor that are studying for translation work at the Worldview Institute in India that Brother Overton had asked we pray for. Why don't we pray for these men, all right? And uh, just stick them in your Bible, and as you pray, pull that out, and just remember these fellows in prayer as they prepare to translate. Many of these men are going to go to people groups who have no Bible whatsoever, and they'll translate the Word of God for them. Uh, so they can have the scriptures. Uh, it's a great work. And uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's invest in prayer uh, that God will raise these men up to do a great work for Him. Amen? All right. When does heaven are open? The blessings are falling tonight. Here we go. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart Since Jesus made everything right I gave him my old tattered garment He gave me a robe of pure white I'm feasting on manna from heaven And that's why I'm happy That's why you're happy That's why we're happy tonight God bless you, you're dismissed Choir, come right on up Don't forget your turkeys Cut me off. Don't forget your turkeys in the fellowship hall. Thank you.